So good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for another of um, the Lepada Leaders episode. And today I'm joined by three um, people with great experience who have lots of stories to share with us. But the exciting thing is we're talking about art and its role in hospitality. And given that we are actually allowed into some places now, uh, it couldn't come at a better time because we don't have to just sort of sit there salivating at the thought of seeing culture again. We can actually engage with uh, hospitality and culture. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our panel. Um, so we have Maureen Tangri from MT Art Agency, um, who uh, earned her spurs very, very young uh, in the gallery world, but decided that it wasn't quite for her and saw the sort of restrictiveness of the traditional gallery setup. So began MT Art Agency in 2015. And it's, um, I think, the first talent agency for visual artists, uh, and it's an internationally based company. Uh, they do some fantastic projects, which we're going to hear about in, the, in a moment. Uh, and really, um, one of the kind of mantras is to identify that next rising star in the art world that we're all sort of desperate to know who that is, especially if you're investing. Um, and there are a lot of uh, public um, sort of art projects that uh, they've been involved in. And I think one which is, is the largest public art project or painting in the world, which took place in Paris, which we may hear a little bit about as well. Then um, we also have Krishma Singh Deer, um, who is head of design at the Londoner Hotel. And that is a little bit uh, going to just sort of whet our appetite because we're not really allowed in there until September, I think, is the launch date. Um, but we will hear some um, great things that are going on there. Um, Krishma has uh, actually a background in banking before, which means she really knows what the high net worths want. Um, but then uh, trained um, at the interior design at Parsons in New York um, and became the head of design um, at the Edwardian Hotel. So working on on the Edwardian Hotel in Manchester. And you may also know that they um, own the Mayfair Hotel in London that many of you may be familiar with. So, and then last but not least is Harry Triggs, who's the director and founding director actually of TM Lighting. Um, and I think many people watching today will be familiar with TM Lighting or certainly the projects and the gallery spaces they've worked in uh, because they cross the entire gamut um, from commercial galleries to um, established um, uh, museums, galleries, but also quite a lot of hospitality venues. So um, they are working currently on the Londoner. So we'll hear a little bit more about those inst installations. Um, they worked on the Newt in Somerset um, room uh, with Anthony Gormley at the Beaumont Hotel. Um, and also, I think they're busy working on the Theatre Royal Drury Lane, or is that project already yes, finished? Yeah, we are, we are at the moment, at, uh, probably with a similar, a fairly similar opening date to uh, the Londoner. Oh, well, there we go. Okay, so, and they're not that far away. We could do a little walk between the two. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, just before we start, um, you will see that there's a chat function and a question and answers. Um, throughout the kind of the conversations, there might be links appearing in uh, the chat area um, to just give you uh, a steer on, on extra materials or things that you might want to know. And then if you wish to ask any questions, then please do pop them in the questions and answers section and we will get those at the end of today. And the discussion um, will be approximately about for sort of 40 minutes. Um, so thank you. What I, what I thought I might do is start off with a, a generic question to each of you and then um, drill down a little bit more into what each of you do and then we'll continue the discussion. So the, the sort of opening question really is, is the role of art in, hosp in hospitality and um, how it helps you build a narrative, I guess. So I'm going to start um, with Krishma on that, who's sort of busy um, actually building those two elements now. So what, what do you see as the role of uh, art in hospitality? Why, why bother? I think the role of art um, is incredibly important, especially now more than ever with uh, both the um, hotels trying to create these boutique experiences and unique experiences, as well as customers wanting to engage more with uh, the visuals of a hotel through Instagram and everyone being a bit more aware of their visual surroundings. But the role of art 
in my view, to do it successfully is to kind of show the personality and communicate the ethos of the hotel and the story behind it. And I think it's a really good communication tool between the customer and, and the hotel itself. Um, and finally, I think that art has the ability to create um, the lasting memories for customers. So when they take photos or when they're just, you know, if an artwork has had an impact on you, you really remember it. And I think it's a lasting impression, which um, is what you want as a hotelier to achieve. And thank you. And Harry. Yeah, well, I, I think during during COVID, during lockdown, we've all become accustomed to being surrounded by our, our home collections. Um, and I think we've you know, we've enjoyed uh, being surrounded by art and we've also been so starved of, of culture. So now we're coming back into uh, hospitality. We've, we've become accustomed to that and we really want to be surrounded by artwork again. And as Krishna was saying, we, we want those unique boutique experiences. We really want to be, uh, to have a differential between um, other brands. And we want, you know, we, I suppose the enjoyment of art is is crucial to that uh, that experience now in hospitality. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. And um, moving on to to Maureen, I wonder actually, as well as answering that question, whether you might give us um, a little introduction um, to what you do, really. And uh, I met I forgot to mention all the awards you've won as well uh, in kind of creating this. Yes. Nauseous. I'm glad you didn't. Um, is it possible to get my what I sent on the screen at the same time so then I can just talk it through? Um, but so I think two things I'm really passionate about is one, um, rethinking how we can support artists and, and how we can therefore provide the best support behind them. So we finance artists in the start of the company in terms of studio and production costs and have a team that manage them and hopefully make them accomplish their dreamiest of projects, but also the people they want to meet and, and the coverage they want to get, which is quite magical. The, the model is built on the talent agencies that you have in Hollywood. So my mentor, Michael Lovitz, built CAA, which is one of the biggest talent agencies in, in Hollywood. And the way he was talking to me about how he built the careers of famous um, you know, actors or musicians or sportives really inspired me because it felt like a much stronger accelerated and support system that I was foreseeing um, in my past uh, business, which was a gallery in Beverly Hills at the time. So that's on the talent agency. And the second thing, so very similar to, to Hollywood, but not only do they represent usually actors, but they also build really incredible concept for the studios to sell, whether that's a movie, whether that's a campaign. So we're very similar where we like to spot hopefully the most inspiring artists and, and really kind of support them. But we also like to make sure that um, we can integrate the arts and the most incredible of projects. And that's more the creative agency. So today I specialize in the creative agency. And because I wanted to make sure that you kind of got a glimpse because I think that sounds um, that reinforces the, the panel a lot more on the hospitality and the need to support that as well. Um, we had a very um, special pandemic, if I can say this, because it's obviously a drastic time. But uh, one thing that is a positive is we were able to really reinforce the role of the arts through that by all the public art projects that we did. And we helped. Westminster and the Crown Estate throughout to reinvent Regent Street, to reinvent multiple streets that we're working on, integrating public art and supporting net retails. And nothing made me more happy than showing that actually art is not just something that comes when you have everything, but actually even in a time where things are difficult for their shareholders, then it is something that can really help. So that was incredibly meaningful as, as horrible as the pandemic was. Um, to be able to show that. So if you go down through, through the PDF, I think there's a few key examples. Rosewood Hotel was obviously closed, like a lot of hotels were closed. Um, so we had, they have these beautiful courtyards in Holborn and we were able to put like a neon sculpture by Lauren Baker, who is here captured. So we had actually lots of people who emotionally on, on you know, going through all the walks and the walks that we were allowed to do um, we're going to see this and, and it was quite nice it was popping up on Instagram every two seconds and and I think for Rosewood as well which you know they have the sense of like real magic like if you go into the whole building it's kind of this grand Georgian building it has almost marble everywhere and that statement very resonated with 
um, what Rosewood wanted to sell, sell at the time. So that was a really nice way to make sure that the Rosewood was staying in people's mind and it was using the public art side of a uh, sculpture of Lauren Baker to do this. Um, other examples um, through the PDF are, if you continue to scroll, um, and that's a really nice shot um, of the Rosewood. That's very recently, um, we just turned, so that's actually really interesting. And I'm sure that's something that we're going to explore with Krishma and Harry, but we spoke about it for um, earlier where we said, how can art be also part of the storytelling and the narrative of uh, the hospitality brands that they partners with? And I think Bagatelle was with Oprah Gallery and, and they decided to have a complete rethink on what they were standing in terms of visual image and perception in terms of their clients, but also who they were attracting and, and how they were going to do so and how they, they could be associated with a side of the art world that was a bit different. So that's a piece by Robert Montgomery, who is an amazing artist that has always this poetic, the, this poems that you see either as land art piece, either as sculptural pieces. And we, we've kind of helped them to shift the way they're perceived. And I think to have poetry in an environment that was a, you know, not really so much poetic before that was really meaningful as well. And I think it's helping shifting the narrative that they want to have. Um, so if we continue, yeah, that's a few examples for Bagatelle, which is a big change for anyone who's been partying and throwing champagne bottles at Bagatelle before. This is quite a change in terms of the aspect that they used to have. Um, so I think um, something that, so yes, so out of all places, a week before COVID, I was leading a feminist festival in Saudi with Vice, which the three things don't normally associate each other. I think MTR is very good at bringing conversations around the art that might not be obvious. Um, so, you know, you mentioned that one of the projects that people really have in their heads for us is when we close the Sean Mars in Paris in partnership with the FL Tau, our artist SAPE and, and The Guardian. But we really are able to bring different shareholders behind a project that probably wouldn't be able to speak in the first place. And that's something that we're super passionate about because we really think that's also something that's really strong in terms of all the arts. So that's a key example of an amazing public artwork by Lauren Baker um, in surrounded by the cliff of Alula in Saudi, which is incredible. And also amazing that it was a female artist and amazing that it was in that context. And I just had generally the most incredible conversation uh, there for any music lover, Jean-Michel Jarre was the the Belgian musician behind that, which was matching literally the 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 art with the music on the cliff. It was absolutely incredible. Wow! I mean, I would have loved to have been there. That looks incredible. Intellectually fascinating. Um, and so that's the, the last one and final one for me because I think we should definitely hold on to the other two, but. Um, that's actually really interesting because when all the retail stores were closed, we said to L'Occitane, realistically, you should, it's, it's not because the retail is closed that people are not going to pass by the retail. Of course, the, the food fall that has gone through um, Regent Street has drastically gone down, but there's still a lot of um, people who work and live there who were still being passing by. And I think the way you, build, you built emotion, emotional attachment to a brand or a company is also doing times that are not easy. Um, so we actually advise them to uh, turn, you can see that the upstairs floor in this translucent vinyls, almost like churches where you kind of see through and then you project light behind it. And that was the peak of January and February where there was no light at all. And then you can see on the left hand side, the self portrait of Claire Luxton with our modern Cindy Sherman about it. And, that was super well received in press, super well received on social media. I think they were a bit scared to do anything in that context, but actually turn with the right narrative was really well perceived. And I think something that we could therefore track in terms of how people then came back by the second they opened and mentioned it, um, which in my head reinforces the fact that of course it's hard to make this decision when you don't know the future of the company or, or, or your teams as well. But I think in that instance, that was a very successful study case for that. Amazing, thank you. I think um, I, I, I couldn't agree more. It was very obvious and it felt very sad. Those shops that kind of closed dramatically on the last lockdown and the Christmas decorations just kind of dust for months on end as you walk past thinking, 
go this is you know even if you're doing an online business actually it's still your shop window and and that was so important so um going to get back to Krishma I think in terms of um you're you're kind of in the middle of building this but one of the things that sort of worries me always with hotel art is um how do you stop it just being a sort of backdrop decoration so um well, I think we've touched on it in some of the examples that Marine just showed, but um, what what I think s separates it from being that is when you in, um, involved whoever's curating your art, as well as push the interior designers and the architects and the engineers to sort of have that discussion about art quite early on, or try and have the flexibility if they're not brought early on to work with them in order to integrate the artwork. So it's just got, it has a feel of that it's part of the narrative, as well as the fact that it's, it's just got this holistic view with it, with, so that the, it, it, it sort of made the most, that the most is made out of the artwork. So I think we've got a few examples in the Londoner where, well, we've got one in particular on the building where we had to um, do some public art, it's in the presentation, but um, it's integrated with, we had to integrate the, artist Ian Monroe with the architecture from uh, Rob Stoyle as well as Woods Baggett and in addition to that with Arapa engineers to integrate these hand terracotta tiles into um, which was our public art into the facade of the building so I mean I just think it really does stop being a backdrop when you integrate it in so many different ways that it's actually part of the materiality of the hotel itself. And how, and in terms of how that's expressed when people come and when they book, is is that sort of front and center of how this super boutique hotel is is going to be sort of marketed? Shared with people? It will definitely the artwork of how that this is marketed is is a key part of the hotel. So we've actually we're actually training also all of the staff. The staff are just amazed by the artwork as it's going up. And they've all got the art Bibles and learning who all the artists are throughout it. And it's all part of the narrative. And like, you know, we had from the very early discussions because we were creating a hotel, which, um, which was a new brand in itself. So the Londoner, I mean, it's a new brand for Indian hotels. It's, uh, and when we were giving the briefing to our interior designers, as well as the art, art consultants, the the way that we wanted the art to be portrayed was to show this personality. So it was the fact that we wanted to have this um, show that we were a diverse. Uh, we wanted to attract um, a diverse crowd. We were very inclusive. We also wanted to have this idea that we had a sense of wittiness. So um, because a hotel of this grandeur, we just wanted to have a little bit of a sense of humor. And we integrated that in a funny way with these letters in our bathrooms as a sense of like toilet humor. Um, and it's just these little nods, I think, which will just like intrigue our customers. They may not see it all to begin with, but I think it's part of the journey and like, you know, conversation points between customers when they're in the hotel. So, and it's also the job of all of our hosts to be able to explain it to our customers. So is the toilet humor going to, translate into every language um <laughs> I'm not sure uh, it's, it's it's quite like <laughs> it's uh it's quite on the line but it's a very British way it's these letters which are done by the Connor brothers and they're redacted letters and they're quite tongue-in-cheek um I hope our guests see the sense of humor in them because we find them but hilarious I think we'll come to it a little bit later but of course you're building it in such an iconic part of London that all of that humor must kind of for, sort of be part of that but one of the things and actually um it, it could lead on to Harry I think is is you know how how do you kind of use art to um differentiate I suppose the purpose and the mood of certain areas so you, is that sort of part of the conceiving and and I think we then move on to Harry um in terms of chatting about how to sort of light that because that's obviously so much part of it as well yeah so I mean we have different artworks within our space which actually change during the day so we have this really interesting bar which is just for residents only and it's called our residence lounge and 
during the day it's just wood paneling with very faint artwork oh. you can't see it but at night you flip on a switch because we wanted to change it from potentially where our guests are working to an environment where they would want to have drinks in the evening and the graffiti work just comes out as like neon light like subtle neon lighting on the paneling and it just it's this immersive experience and the same thing happens in the lounge which is you go over a bridge and you're in this lounge room and during the day there's brass metal rods around it but then at night, when you're ready for drinks, we have these murals which come down and they almost feel like tapestries. And you're suddenly in this dreamscape of what um, on view the artist's interpretation was of what Hampstead Heath looks at, like at night. So, I mean, I think it's these things which really create like different experiences for our customers. And it was also the thought of bringing in like the West End and the drama of the West End, the theater of the West End into our into our hotel, but done in a subtle and, you know, creative and different way. Thank you. And so Harry, maybe talk a little bit about how, how you've kind of helped differentiate those moods through the lighting and... Yeah, well, light, lighting's really the, the silent hero to, to our collections. And it, it, it's the, the thing that we, we don't see, but allows us to, to see the art. And um, I think what's really interesting, what Krishna touched on was the, the setting of mood and the differentiation of mood through different times in the day. Um, and obviously art forms this kind of uh, almost visual hierarchy to lead you through the different spaces and to, and to uh, determine the mood. And then the, the lighting allows you not only to kind of, it, it provides a point of focus that leads us through those artworks um, but I, I think with the Londoner I think the architecture in itself forms so much part of the uh, of the artwork that the art becomes intrinsic not only to the brand but to the to the architecture as well so I think that the lighting is a very uh, subtle way to present the art collection um, and you know lighting you know the thing we always say is it, it, is it shouldn't really be seen and then the, it's the play as well between light and and shadow, and that kind of that passes through hospitality because, you know, in, in our offices everything is you know lit to a kind of a fairly even level, but when we go into hospitality, we we want a kind of a sense of intimacy, and we want these these pools of light that lead us uh, between different spaces that highlight art in in different ways, but albeit a sculpture or. Uh, the roof terrace at, at the Londoner or the or the whiskey bar or, and every space is determined in a different way by the way in which the lighting uh, illuminates the, the murals or the or the flat art on the walls. Yes certainly in some areas of hospitality we want to be seen in and in others we want to it, it all to be a bit muted and um, just thinking taking actually and just thinking about um, you Maureen and some of of the projects you've been involved in I mean we, we're talking very much about arts and hospitality as an indoor thing but of course actually you're also sort of hosting and hospitable when you're looking at sort of um, public sculpture down maybe Regent Street or, or projects in Bond Street and um, is the the lighting actually something that you get quite involved in with that because obviously we saw with Rosewood that the thing that kind of you know, that was the sort of lighting installation with the neon, but is that very crucial? To oh, we lost her to Wi Fi. Did I just come in and out of that? Yes. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, I got the question. I just, I thought this is me. I'm like, for some reason, very central, but we have a terrible Wi-Fi. So I was like, oh gosh, this is going to be on me. Um, there was a conference I did last year where I just kept on reappearing at every single of my question with trauma. Um, I think the, it's really interesting because, so I've, I've sold art to collectors for the past 12 years. Yeah. And then public art for about four and a half now um, in terms of public art projects. And then brand collaboration or hospitality around the same time. Um, yeah. I would say, although this are all different arms in the business, so there's, you, don't, you wouldn't have the same colleague that would manage this. I think the, the principles are exactly the same, um, where you, you ultimately, 
want to make sure that you reinforce the story of the person, the company, the place, um, and, and kind of really build a strong storytelling with the works that you're placing and, and, and really understand, therefore, how you're going to build that story with the right artworks or the right projects. Or, and, and, you know, you can see with even just the various examples, I think you will not partially go with the same way with Bagatelle that you will go for a Rosewood. Those are just very different environments. Um, so I love, I'm, I love stories and I, maybe that's why I landed with a business model that was inspired from Hollywood, but I like good stories and I like things that makes, you know, that inspires you as a story. And I like to use the art to do that. So public art for me is the same thing. I just always imagine how can I just stop that attention for just a few seconds, retain that attention for that person to feel that little bit inspired because in comparison to obviously being in a home where you constantly come back to it and you get to see the details even more and you get to appreciate that even more, sometimes you just have just that few seconds to just really grab the attention. And, and let's face it, there's also advertising screens and, and kind of screaming um, everything that will try and grab this attention. So I'm here fighting for that attention in that context. Um, and it's, it's magical every time you, you kind of attract it. I mean, my favorite thing is always, and I share this with some of my artists, is to hide uh, from a wall of a distance um, or like being in a cafe and watch the reactions of people towards the public art, which is the same, I'm sure, for Krishma and Harry when they see people finally in the spaces, you know, of the Londoner and see people kind of thinking this is truly magical. So the, I think the drive is the same and I think that the passion is the same. In terms of the lighting, I mean, the UK and, and the, the pouring rain is definitely not the best lighting. I'm currently working on an amazing project with URW in LA and I must say, like, I'm quite excited about this lighting with some of the projects I'm putting forward. Um, so you have to bear in mind, therefore, that I think the UK is a place where I would want to add as many colors as I can. I think when I do the public art project and I would want to add as many textures because I'm also conscious that I can be more settled in a country where there's literally sunny light. And you've seen that in Saudi as well, where you have this beautiful desert light. You can be very settled in the metal that you use and you don't need to reinforce anything. I think it's more, you have to be conscious of the weather forecast and, and the place you're in and, and the time of, that people will be able to spend looking at it in that context. So it's it's exactly the same that if you were in a house or if you were in a hospitality context. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and yes, apologies again for my in out, but hopefully that that won't be happening again. Um, Harry, just um, thinking about your comment earlier at the beginning of our kind of a thirst for culture. Um, do you think lots of people are using art as their way, art and culture, to bring people back into their venues um, post-pandemic? And um, I was going to maybe add to that a little bit about how venues and businesses use art, and then that allows us to show some of your wonderful projects as well. So maybe if you answer that and could speak to some of your projects and we can share your slides, that'd be great. Yeah, if we could bring up some of the slides. I, th I think people are... are I think Maureen touched on this. People are very hungry for uh, unique experiences. And I, I, you know, albeit the, the drive of Instagram and social media, but also I, I think as well, we've been so starved of, of galleries and culture and, and uh, exposure to art at the moment that we, we're desperate to go out and, and see, see art, be surrounded by art and, and art, having art in hospitality provides us with one of those unique experiences to, to yep. allow us to do that. And the slide that was uh, just up a moment ago, that's uh, disappeared briefly, was of the Beaumont Hotel. And that's a, uh, that's a really interesting one. So uh, Jeremy King uh, commissioned, at uh, the Beaumont Hotel commissioned Anthony Gormley to make this four story um, artwork that sits up on the facade and you can you can rent this artwork and and be within it and it's a it's a fantastic piece by Gormley and it's about the the it, it's almost entirely about light and our recognition of light and we had a, a quite a surreal moment where I'd, I'd lay in bed with 20 contractors surrounding us uh, with Anthony Gormley lying next to me where we were staring up into the ceiling <laughs> talking about whether we could see the light yet or, you know with 20 guys in high vis surrounding us which is uh, I think probably one of the most surreal moments of my life 
Um, and after about 15, 12, 15 minutes, the cones at the, the back of your eye become accustomed to the light and you start yeah. to make out the very foundation of, of form. But of course, it's a very, um, it's a very difficult thing to realize in a very, very dark space. Yeah. And this is a, you know, a, a phenomenal project to, to work on. And we were involved with a, a, a number of consultants and Amazing. it was, uh, I think this is this is very different um, from what we were talking about before, which is art being intrinsic to the space. Yeah. It's more about a hero piece of public art to to gain people's public interest rather than art throughout the space. Not to say, obviously, throughout the the, the restaurant, there's art as well, and and, and art is in, in, intrinsic to the space. But here, the focus was on this large public piece of art. And as okay. we go through some of the later photos. Uh, this is an interesting one. This is a work by Richter in, um, in Beaverbrook. Um, and this is, again, having, you know, striking pieces of artwork in, in public areas that you, you really are, are ultimately drawn to. And of course, you know, most of the time in, in public spaces as well, we lose the art. It's, it's not well lit. It's not well illuminated. It just becomes a kind of a, a background to the to the environment, but by being able to enhance it, suddenly it becomes a centerpiece to, to this foyer. And as we, uh, this again, a very interesting piece. Um, this is Brasserie of Light in Selfridges. Um, we do a lot of work with uh, Damien Hurst um, from his exhibitions through to uh, private pieces. Um, but this is great because this was obviously a piece of, a public art, a piece of public sculpture. The wingspan of, of, of Pegasus is, I think, is about six and a half, seven meters, and it sits above the main portion of the restaurant. Uh, and it's almost a kind of a, a, a mirror ball of light that reflects and refracts through the space. It, in the mornings, it gets this incredible natural light as the sun rises. Um, and in the evenings, of course, it becomes this kind of glowing center point to the restaurant, which has become it's intrinsic now to the food, to the decor, to the to the uniforms, to the whole the whole brand. Um, and of course, lighting of this piece is 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 crucial. Very difficult to implement because there was so many different parties involved, and we came in very very late in the game to be able to do this. Um, but again, it, it, I think the concept, if without this artwork, it's very much it's it's another restaurant, it's another brasserie, um, mm. and but suddenly there's this huge point of differential where people not only want to go for the amazing food or the drinks, they actually want to go for the experience, and you know, and I think as Maureen was saying again, the the, the idea of unique experiences is we you know we're hunting for those, and I think we always have. We've had this accentuation recently where so many people people want that differential point and it becomes hugely, hugely important, not only to the um, venue, but also to the brand. Mm. And actually, as you go through a little bit further, that well, farm this is uh, Pharmacy 2 at Newport Street Gallery. Um, again, these beautiful stained glass pieces which uh, illuminate the, the restaurant. And you can see the train going past, but in the evenings they're, they're self-illuminated uh, with this kind of uh, diffuse light. And then the following image, and I think this is an interesting one. I think, again, we were, we were talking about the integration of um, art, not only into hospitality, but into retail. And this is an interesting collaboration with um, Victoria uh, Beckham and Sotheby's Old Masters. So you've got this incredible juxtaposition of um, of classical art in a very contemporary uh, space, like beautiful architecture, um, with obviously contemporary uh, fashion as well. So you've, this idea of um, uh, kind of skewing people's ideas on the way that you know classical art doesn't just need to be in historic settings. You can, and I think uh, Victoria Beckham was probably one of the first people to do this in terms of of, uh, of certainly in retail. Um, and this is a you know a really fascinating um, fascinating idea. Yeah, no, it was a great project. Um, um, and then this is just uh, 
this is the new down in Somerset, again, fantastic venue. And then this is just the importance of, of the illumination in art to really set, really to treat art uh, or art lighting as a, as a kind of almost a theatrical tool. So here we've got kind of ambient lighting within the space, but the we, we use picture lighting here as a tool. And so we were working with the consultants to use picture lighting as a tool to highlight the walls, because of course, most of the time what we actually see is the walls. We're looking, we're looking straight forward. And when the walls aren't illuminated or, or they're, they're plain or flat, we're not really looking at anything. So creating these gems of interest that, that we're, we're focusing on as we walk through your space. And picture lighting has this lovely way of creating these little pools of light, um, accentuating different artworks, which is, you know, is, a, is a crucial part of our, our appreciation of a space, provides visual hierarchy, visual definition, and also a kind of a, almost a domestic warmth to what can be quite a, you know, a, can be lofty or, or kind, of, um, uh, kind of vast spaces. Lovely, thank um, you. Yeah, and this is a, this is a silly silly photo of just to really show the scale of the uh, scale of the room. We uh, we managed to get up onto the onto the next roof. Time and, um, you are lying next to Anthony Gormley and about to launch a project. Could we please get an invitation? <laughs> yeah, I will. I will. He's a, he's a, he's an absolutely. He was a gentleman. He was a gentleman. We, he, <laughs> and we do like to lie down and kind of just watch the light for a while. How wonderful. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. That was really good. Um, really uh, nice walkway. And I think what was great as well was just seeing the very different disciplines as well in the different settings and hearing about the, the thought that goes into it. Um, I suppose one of the other things that I, I feel has been quite a step change in the last few decades is actually some of these venues building quite serious collections of art. Um, and uh, I think, you know, that that's been something. And I wonder, Krishna, with your sort of just looking at how you how you accommodate that. So obviously you're kind of in the middle of placemaking and, and getting the Londoner together. Um, how does that work? You know, uh, are you are you there looking at a budget and sort of thinking, OK, well, we can do this. And some of it's about the sort of design and feel of the the and some of it we're going to actually get some really serious artists here how how does that sort of work in terms of what you're doing at the moment well i actually think that's a really good question because um i mean we all have to work generally within a budget yeah. so um it's uh it's just interesting about how you basically combine pieces because not everything can be those big ticket items and how how you mix them all together so um you know, for instance, in our gallery walls, we've we've combined um, high high um, very expensive artwork. Like we have a print of an Anthony Gormley, um, and we're mixing that in with other more local artists and artists who people might not have known about. Um, and for instance, in other spaces, we had a really great, and I was sold on the idea of putting this uh, metal artwork on um, the ceiling of our all day dining restaurant because it was a restaurant which we really needed to pull people back in for different times of the day and putting on this metal piece of artwork, which dependent where you're seated, seated within the restaurant, you got a different view. And um, again, with the lighting and everything else, I really wanted to have this artwork in there. And I thought it would be a real draw. Um, but the, the artist was just, it was just way above budget. And the way we got around this was the designer herself who um, designed the interiors was an architect in training. And she said, you know what? I feel so passionate about this. Can I be the artist? And I was just like, sure, please go ahead. I have full faith, please just do it. Because I'm so, I know that you will be able to achieve exactly what we're looking for because she knew the full narrative behind the space. She came up with a narrative for the space. And it was this idea of um, this, this, it was supposed to be um, uh, a writer who was a fashion writer. And it's a nod also to the fact that we have first magazine across the road. So it's a fashion writer who, um, uh, and we, we use fashion photography by, um, and graphic, uh, graphic designers in one part of it. And then we use fashion photography to, um, with 
hats. And the idea behind the whole hats was um, the fact that there were old millineries on Whitcomb Street and this restaurant's called Whitcomb's. So it was yeah. about again, bringing the area within it and the history of the space within. And the line work, I think, was really effective at creating this statement piece within this uh, ground floor restaurant. And again, that was an extra, the whole place had been budgeted for, but then she came up with this wonderful idea and we just had to make it work. So uh, <laughs> it looks. I mean, what a lovely taster. I can't wait to see that in person. So in terms of, I mean, just thinking, going back to how um, art, hospitality, going back to that sort of thread of the narrative. Um, and I think if, if Chris, maybe you continue and then we'll we'll move uh, across the others. Um, placemaking is, is so important. And I would think, I mean, you have quite a challenge in, you know, Leicester Square is an iconic, iconic place, but it's almost a bit like Times Square. It's become sort of, you know, a mix between street performers, um, uh, lots of tourists, teenagers trying to get away from parents for a bit, clubs that were good 20 years ago which now need to and then you know beyond that of course you've got the theatre and everything else but actually kind of it, it's quite a challenge that you're building a super boutique and and maybe also elevating and changing the area at the same time. Yes that was uh, essentially one of our biggest challenges with this project was um, we kind of wanted to change the narrative of the square. So um, the, the square itself is, as you say, you've described it, it's, it's often a place where people are walking in between St. James's and Soho. And how do you get people to actually stay there and interact with the square? And so we really wanted to bring in a lot of the elements which, you know, which the square is famous for and celebrate these things. So celebrate the performances that happen on the square and bring them in. So we have these, these um, moss and lamb faces of, of basically within our afternoon tea space, we have these accessories of these heads which are located throughout, throughout the ground floor. And it's this idea taking on inspiration from um, people watching on the square people perform and having all these little nods to that within the hotel. So, I mean, despite the fact that we're trying to almost elevate and change the narrative, we still want to celebrate what the existing mm. is about too. Um, but I think that, you know, there's been a lot of investment in the area. So we've had St. James's come up. There's a lot more offices in the area with people coming back to London. It's yeah. where it is changing. We're not the, like uh, Maureen is going to go on about her work, which she's going on the square. And so the, there is so much work going on to try and like, just elevate the experience for people. And, um, and yeah, I think that this hotel hopefully with with its large footprint will will do that um in, in and thank you and and actually yes on to you maureen i i mean i think interesting um that we're you know sort of re-establishing stories and places but presumably some of the work that you're doing is about attracting international visitors but also actually the, you know the the region so the people throughout the UK who need to be brought back to London presumably some of the projects you're engaged in are doing that as well as a post-Covid. Yeah and, and I think the reason Krishna was alluding is because I, I've heard of her, her work and and the Londoner for a few months now because we're working separately with the bid holder uh, on the square itself so on the public art side and I think that shows how exactly what she was saying, how hospitality can shift the way we perceive a place and, and also how art therefore can reinforce it. And, and ultimately it's really disgusting, like how do you build a sense of community? Who is that community? How do you reinforce that community with the art that you bring forward? Um, and so although I sadly can't say much, um, we're specifically working on this square with something really exciting and, and we need literally incredible artists for something permanent as well. Um, which is specifically looking at dynamic on how the square is evolving from just purely a touristic place and, and actually to be recognized in craft, in design and in art as well. So it's, you know, and I think the best example and, and the clients of ours as well are, are Capco on how Covent Garden 20 years ago was, you know, a few, a few stools um, yeah. never kind of visited that much. And then how by commissioning art, by bringing the right brands behind them, um, by being very selective in, in how they were doing it as well. Um, you know, Covent Garden had become pre-COVID and I'm sure will continue after COVID, one of the most um, 
you know most visited but also the place to be in terms of London and and I'm sure you remember 20 years ago that it was just like little markets that you would not really go for detour to see so you see constantly how art and placemaking have been really at the heart of it there's a talk and he's a friend of mine he's called Daniel Glazer he used to be behind the science gallery at King's College London and he's a neuroscientist by training and when I was starting, I did an academic paper in the value of public art and how you measure it, how do you relate it to people as well. And he was very much an inspiration for it, just purely because he was talking about how do you, what is the emotional engagement with the place that you live and work with? And how do you, how do you transform that? How do you impact that positively? And that is at every level, whether you're a commuter, whether you're just going through a place quickly and passing, whether you actually work and live there. And, and I think the I've always loved the neuroscience approach to that because I've been going back to what um, Harry and, and Krishna were talking about in terms of places of hospitality. It is about how you feel in that place. So it is completely emotional um, and the lighting will make you feel a certain way and then the art will make you feel a certain way. And I think it's the, the neuroscience part of it is really relevant to placemaking. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, before I can see, we've got some questions mounting up. So before we go into questions, I've got one more slightly random question for you, Harry. I'm just Sorry. looking at the artworks behind you that I think are a sort of repro of, of um, pictures that you've worked on in the past. But is there an artwork or a venue that you would just absolutely love to get your hands on that you haven't managed and to, to do yet? What would be the absolute... Oh. <laughs> that's such an unfair question isn't it but it's just struck me you, know, you showed me the Rembrandt you showed me who who what canvas what artist haven't you got your hands on yet <laughs> um you know we've been afforded such a, a, a an opportunity to work with so many of my I, I suppose hero artists as a as a as a student and I think um god in terms of collections we've them all well actually marie touched on a on a um michael obitz from caa we, yeah. we had the opportunity to light his uh house uh years ago in la and he has a, uh, probably one of my favorite private art collections that i've ever had the opportunity to work with and when we were working together he kind he, he kind of was floating the idea of, of, of following Getty into doing his own, own gallery space. And if okay. I would, I would love to be involved in that. I think that would, his, his uh, collection of artwork is, is my is absolute favorite. Yeah, you really? get to see a lot of private art collections, but he's really got some, you know, from, I don't know, uh, Jeff Wall to uh, Solar Wit to, uh, and a lot of commissions of Solar Wit sculptures as well wow. and, and, um, and line work. Yeah, yeah I, th I think those are, you know, uh, uh, those would really be up there. Maybe some more, some more uh, Henry Moore sculptures as well. You know, that would be unreal. That'll do it. Amazing. Um, Thank you so much. Um, I, we're just going to sort of have a look at the questions and I'm wondering, are you okay to, to look at those? Gillian, just because it's quite hard on my phone. I have the perfect transition from oh. Michael Lovitz to the first question. Ah. The, the first time, and I'm sure you will know therefore, Harry, the first meeting I had for four hours trying to come up with something deeply intellectual was in his Rothko room where he has like the burnt table yes, made yeah, of ashes yeah. and then the roof coat and that was my oh. 23 years old self was trying to be deeply intelligent and that was definitely a moment I remember very deeply therefore from the yeah. roof impact that they had on you at that point and and I think that kind of I mean I love the story as well of the seagram but I'm actually saying it as a transition to a partial answer to that question that I wasn't feeling reassured that much by the roof coat surrounding me at that point in time and I think that could be I mean, there's a, it's a much longer story to why he didn't stay and how uncomfortable Rothko was in that context to not having his painting stay, because he didn't really like the idea of people just eating and didn't like also the people who will go there. But I also feel like, you know, I think I remember him saying that, um, obviously not personally, but reading Rothko saying that he wanted to intimidate people who were eating there. And I remember feeling very intimidated in that room. So that is probably maybe why it hasn't made it past history. <laughs> love it okay thank you 
Um, let's see if that. I also just wanted to, um, earlier I wasn't quite quick enough with my share screen when Krishma was talking about that um, lounge that has the tapestries come down. So if I just share um, that again, and people can have a look at some of those slides. Is that? Yeah, so this is, uh, this is in the um, part of our residence lounge, which is uh, only accessible for our in-house guests. And it's the second out of the space, which has these, it has a brass rods behind it, which, um, which are open and actually six stories above, um, it's actually open to the elements. So it's got a covering, but if it's a good day, it will actually be light from outside six stories above. Um, during the day and in the evening um, when we're trying to create this different mood and atmosphere these murals come down and I mean I just think it's so great the way that they've painted the ceiling as well as uh, and had these artworks just integrated completely with the room it just makes you feel like you're in this very immersive space and this moon reference is like constantly referenced throughout the hotel um there's sun and the moons uh, there's a moon above reception and it again it goes back to the roots of leicester square and that it, they used to be globe makers on the square and um we just thought we'd subtly reference that with the moon and sun so and it's like it's a, there's a nice nod to it the penthouse right at the top of um right at the top of the hotel with a big moon on top of the bar um so it's just like a nice bit of narrative continuing through through the hotel we, may, we can't wait. When can we come? What's the, is there going to be, a, is it going to be an opening preview that we can all kind of come to? Or do yeah, we, we should definitely organise one. We can organise a tour. At the moment you have to wear PPE though, which is not great. <laughs> not a hard hat any longer. Just yeah, the PPE. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Not so good. But, um, I just saw one, one of the questions was about Julian Opie um, adding, and I, I'm thinking probably around, um, Soho, but adding in that his works to the pavements and um, whether what what did you think of those? Was that sort of a fun, an addition to the city streets of those sort of the walking figures? Um, I think he was possibly one of the first artists to to he's do. In, he's in Euston as well. Um, if you pass Euston Road, that's you can also find his, his sculptures. Um, I mean, my son absolutely adores them. Um, I think seeing walking people in neon just makes him very excited. Yeah. Um, and I think it's it's nice to see, you know, he's also actually contributed to Hospital Rooms, which is a charity that integrates art and hospital. And I think he's definitely been an artist that has tried to integrate his work really early on within um, daily environments, which I deeply mm. respect. And actually, just thinking about that, we haven't touched on that at all, but... Um art in hospitals is incredibly important. Um, and we've concentrated very much on the luxury side, but I, I, um, I remember the sort of one of the first things, my grandmother worked for the Red Cross and her job was to just circulate artworks to different hospitals across the country from posters to, um, you know, oil paintings. And I used to go in there and help catalog at the end of school sometimes. But now there's some very kind of rich um, projects involved. And I wondered if any of you have kind of either touched or, or been inspired by any of that, because I should think, you know, particularly people that stuck in wards for so long during COVID and everything else, it must have been a very helpful way of, of um, you know, coming out of that. There's two charities, there's Painting a Hospital and then Hospital Rooms, I think do a brilliant job. Uh, separately, I think Hospital Rooms is a bit more immersive and, and Painting a Hospital is a bit more what, you were, what your granny was amazingly doing. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I think the mental health aspects has been demonstrated since the early days. That's what, after, when they came back from the Second World War here, that's what they used to do, send soldiers to, um, to art school to kind of heal trauma. And I think also hospital room is specifically integrating art um, within, um, you know, difficult psychologist rooms of, for, for people who really have psychiatric issues. So I think that's really, they might not be able to see anyone for months. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a really nice point of contact for them, hopefully. Um, but we work with both, um, absolutely adore the idea. I think it's really essential. I think Canada is doing it so much better than we are. Um, and mm -hmm. but hopefully we will we'll get better. Do you want to explain why Canada is doing it so much better for the general 
I think the government has really, and the and the doctors have actually always prescribed art as something that was a mental health relief. They seem to have a much stronger conscious of the relationship between health and art. I think here we have it, and obviously the Arts Council is always accentuating it, but although we hear it a lot, I'm not sure this is executed across um, as much as we want it to be. I think even in education, not everyone can have access in the same way. So I, I think they are, they seem to be from what I read, um, a better integration of the arts for everyone and also a better reinforcement of the relationship between health and, and art per se. Well, I think we all we all need it, don't we? So we're in terms of sort of whether we're sick or whether we're just going about our daily life, actually art is just inspirational and incredibly helpful um, to getting through the day. So I think from going to museums, to hotels, to restaurants, we will be enjoying coming and seeing all of the things that you've worked on um, very soon, hopefully. Um, so I'm just going to thank you so much to Maureen, uh, to Harry and to Krishma. Thank you for joining us today. Um, there will be a recording of this as well so that we can share it with people and we can put it on YouTube. So anyone who wants to watch it back later, um, and uh, just a thank you as well to Cultural Communications for putting this panel together and to Gillian um, for manning uh, the, the tech side of it as well. And uh, apologies for, for any of the technical logical wobbles that have been happening today as well. But thank you so much for joining us um, and we hope to see you very soon. Thank, thank you. you.